Hello, can somebody signal me if my audio is coming through? I haven't been able to uh, check it for some reason. Can I get a thumbs up if my audio is coming through? Hi, Scott. Good morning, good morning. Is my audio coming through? Can someone uh, type me a note to let me know if audio is coming through? Are we getting audio? Okay, Rob just confirmed. Rob and Andrea just confirmed. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I was surprised to find out that my Facebook had jumped to the new setup, apparently. I haven't used it yet, so... I was not sure if my audio was coming through or not because I wasn't able to test it. Heck of a time to try to get familiar with this two minutes before you're supposed to go on and teach. So <clears throat> um, let's get started. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, welcome to the Lord of the Harvest uh, Adult Bible Study, Sunday morning Bible study. And uh, it's me again, Mark Palladino. Um, I... Uh, was asked by Pastor Oz to possibly do one more session uh, to help out. So we're doing, going to do that. <clears throat> um, as we pray, uh, prepare for this morning session, um, something I've been rolling around for the last several weeks and thought about sharing it with you a couple of times and just kind of held back. Um, <clears throat> the subject I want to approach with a lot of intellectual humility because it, <clears throat> this morning we're going to talk about the reign of Christ. And uh, it is a <clears throat> multifaceted subject to say the least. Uh, it has implications for our personal life, for our church life, political world around us. It has implications for uh, eschatology in the future and how we view our whole worldview is understanding how the nature of Christ's reign. And I say that I'm going to approach it with intellectual humility because I'm going to throw some things out there today. And um, I recognize uh, that we're all on a journey and my journey into theology <clears throat> has taken me to this place in my understanding. One of the reasons I enjoy my lunches and breakfast with Pastor Oz is because we both recognize that this is a theological journey we don't have all the answers and it's very dangerous when you start to say this is that and this is the way it all has to be and the only way to look at it. So I'm saying all that just to say that uh, I'm going to put these things out there, uh, hopefully can navigate through them in a, in a logical manner, in a way that you can understand. And um, for me, the implications of some of these things are just absolutely staggering. Um, I'm not going to talk about um, coronavirus. I'm not going to talk about the tragic death of that young man in Minneapolis. I'm not going to talk about civic justice or any of the things right now that uh, might be considered relevant. Not that they're not important to me, they are. Uh, my feeling is that God's called me to be a Bible teacher and I'm going to let those with uh, stripes uh, pastors and prophets help the church to interpret those things and how we are to react as the church. My job is a Bible teacher, and so I'm going to try to do that. We're going to try to teach the Bible. We're going to look at a lot of texts and see if we can walk away with a sense of what are these staggering implications of Christ's reign and, and what does that mean for us today and what has it meant for the church and the world for the past 2,000 years. So Father, we 
bow our hearts before you because your wisdom is so great and your word is so powerful and you are just beyond comprehension. So Lord, we try to take now some, uh, gather some insights as to the reign of your beloved son in the earth today and what the cross of Jesus meant, not only for the church, but the world. And Father, we pray that we will find uh, and understand our role uh, better today and, and just have a better grasp of your kingdom, of your reign on the earth, and your reign in our lives. And Lord, we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Last week, we spent some time in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to go back to that to kind of use it as a, a launching pad. Um, I will repeat a few things that I talked about last week, but hopefully not too much. But in 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5, Paul lays out some pretty powerful things. Um, Beginning in, uh, we'll say, we'll, we'll start about uh, verse, well, we start at verse 17. That he says that if, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. And the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Powerful statement. Not counting their trespasses against them. Not talking about us. He's talking about them. And he committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him to be, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness, or maybe better, the justice of God in him. Paul makes a very powerful statement when he says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And what he's getting at here is not to be understood or mistakenly understood in the, in the sense of salvation or salvific sense. But in reality, it's the language of peace. It's the language of international peace. It's the language of uh, political and international relations of God with the world. Uh, we would be, be a, some way take a verse like this and, and embrace universalism. Well, see, it says everybody is saved. God's reconciled the world to himself. And that's really not Paul, what Paul's talking about because the, the scriptures clearly make a difference between the church and the unchurched, the what is what is belonging to God in terms of his domain, his, his, his uh, mountain, if you will, his kingdom among his people, and those that are outside of it. And God isn't portrayed, as we said last time, that, the, that, 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 uh, that God is somehow just the recipient of Jesus' sacrifice, that is something to appease his anger, but as the one who's actually operating through Jesus' execution, through Jesus' death, taking the initiative, the restorative initiative to, um, as the divine victim, as the one who has been offended, um, to, to absorb the injustice in himself and offer forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, and that's kind of what Paul means in verse 20 when he says, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making appeal through us, be reconciled to God. Paul is basically saying, this is our, this is our call to the world. This is our, our voice in the world, is that God has reconciled the nations, reconciled the world to himself through Christ. He has put himself in a peaceful position in relationship to the world, a covenant of peace, if you will, through the death of Christ, um, maybe an, a, an awesome image of that might be if we go back to the, the, the Ark of Noah, you know, as the Ark, uh, we, we, we discussed this in, in a recent class here with my group at uh, Shepherd's Gate, that, you know, when the Ark settled in the mountains of Ararat and, God, and, and, and Noah played the role of God by uh, sending out a raven, which speaks of God's universal provision, and see, sending out a dove, and it came back, sending out another dove, and it came back again, the dove, of course, being the spirit. Finally, the dove 
is sent out on the new creation. Once the curse is passed, the judgment is passed. That judgment of, of Noah is like the judgment on Christ at the cross. And, and the dove, uh, a dove comes back with, a, with an olive leaf that is the symbol of peace and reconciliation. And so as the judgment of, is passed, now there is a state of reconciliation between God and his creation. It's a new creation, if you will. It's a place where he will be able to dwell. Very important. Because God originally created this planet, not as just a globe to look at from the sky, from heaven, and, and have a lot of bunch of creatures running around on it. He created it as a domain, as a throne room. The garden was his throne room, his place of rest, as I mentioned to you last time. Just as Jesus said, I will give you rest. Come unto me, you who are labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. That he was not speaking about naps. He was not thinking about an easy chair. That God's rest is his enthronement. And so when God rested on the seventh day, he took up his enthronement in the earth. And when man sinned, sin, the, the earth became a sin-infested uh, planet. And so it wasn't until the time of Exodus where we see a new creation coming forth, a tabernacle in which God could dwell again and be enthroned in the Holy of Holies and set certain conditions for man. But that looked both backward to the garden as a heavenly throne, but it also looked forward to the time of Christ's sacrifice, when through the sacrifice God would again find a place to enthrone himself in the world. But when we start talking now about, about God having established his reign in the earth, it conjures up all sorts of ideas in our minds of what that might look like. Some of our friends in the dispensational world want to tell us that that's going to be a time when at the end of the world or the millennium or whatever you might call it, we imagine Jesus sitting on some throne and the whole world around him is at perfect peace. All the bad guys have been put away. And that's an interesting perspective, but it's not a biblical perspective. We can't think in terms of kings and their rule and sovereign kings, especially a king of kings, the way... Uh, we might think about it in a Western world or Western cultural mindset. To be the king, to be the sovereign king, Jesus actually tells us precisely how his kingdom, how his kingship will be established in the world. And that is in Matthew 13. Matthew 13, just such a powerful and important chapter. It's got all kinds of parables in there about how the kingdom will unfold, what's going to happen at the end of the age, not the end of the world. The end of the, the age. Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law. And so the anticipation of his contemporaries was that there was a coming end to the age, the age of Torah, the Olam Haza, the, the, the current age, and that the Messiah would bring in the Olam Haba, the age to come. So when Jesus spoke of the end of the age, he was speaking of the end of his own age, the end of the age of law, and how through his death and his resurrection and his ascension into heaven, and ultimately through the destruction of Jerusalem, through that transition, the age would come to an end. It would give birth to the messianic age, the hoped uh, Olam Haba, the new world, the new age in which Messiah would reign. And Jesus explains in a parable what his reign would look like. And he says in verse 31 and 32, very two simple phrases here. He presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And it is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now we might say to us, oh, that means the kingdom is going to get real big. Well, yeah, it does, but it, but it has a specific reference point that Jesus is calling our attention to, that his kingdom will be a certain type of kingdom that although it's not totally familiar with in our world, you know, especially in the Western world, we have presidents and Congress and things like that, 
but he's talking about an ancient kind of kingdom that the scholars refer to as a suzerainty relationship with the nation, nations, S-U-Z-E-R-A-I-N-T-Y. Now, the covenant of su suzerainty, was very, suzerainty was very common in the ancient world. It's, it was based upon ancient Hittite laws. It was a form of, of government when a king, a conquering king, would um, control other nations once it had established its seat of power in the ancient Near East. And that suzerainty, the, the references that Jesus gives in Matthew 13, actually directly come from two chapters. One is Daniel chapter 4 in the Old Testament, tells us about Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And in, De in Ezekiel 31, where he talks about Assyria's kingdom. In, in, in uh, Daniel chapter 4, starting verse, first at verse 12, He's talking about Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And it, verse 11, it says, The tree grew, grew large and became strong, and its height reached the sky, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, and its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant. Sound familiar? Jesus is talking about a great tree. Then he says, Its foliage was, so, was beautiful, its fruit abundant, and it was, and it was for food for all. The beast of the field found shade under it, the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. The living creatures fed themselves from it. So he's describing Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, suzerainty kingdom, as extending like a great tree over the earth. And then in Ezekiel, if you want to flip to Ezekiel, if you, hopefully you have your Bible. Ezekiel chapter 31. Ezekiel 31 is one of the oracles against Egypt. Interesting set of scriptures at the time that uh, Jerusalem was being pounded by Nebuchadnezzar and, ba and, and, the, and the city of Babylon. Jer uh, uh, Ezekiel is out among the exiles in the sub suburbs of Babylon, and God says, I want to talk to you about Egypt. It's funny how God sometimes... I, I'm sure that Ezekiel was saying, don't you know what's going on in Jerusalem right now? And you want to talk to me about Egypt? Well, anyway, that's another day. But his, his, this is one of the oracles against Egypt, against Pharaoh. And in chapter 31, verse 5 and 6, uh, what he's telling Pharaoh is, look at Assyria. I gave Assyria such a glorious place in the world. But look at them now. Be warned, you think you're so great, you're so powerful. But I'm coming, and you're next. And I think that was the reason God gave Ezekiel that message. You see what's going on in Jerusalem? You're next. You see what happened to Assyria? You're next. But he says of Assyria, therefore, um, uh, let's, let's go all the way up to verse 3. Behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches and forest shade and very high and its top was among the clouds, and its waters, and the waters made it grow. Uh, the deep made it high. With its rivers, it continually extended around its planting place and sent out channels to all the trees of the field. Therefore, its height was loftier than all the trees of the field, and its boughs became many with its branches long. Because of many waters, it spread them out. And the birds of the heaven, again, we're at Matthew 13, the birds of the heavens nested in its boughs, and under its branches, all the beasts of the field gave birth. Now, he explains with a kind of poetic parallelism, and all the great nations lived under its shade. And Ezekiel explaining to us what that means to have the, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field lodging under its shade. And Jesus used the same analogy when he, he gave that parable in, of the sower, when he told the disciples in Mark that, this is the key to understanding all parables. When he said that the, the birds ate the seeds, he, he likened that to the devil, to the, to the enemy forces. And so what Jesus is telling us here is that his kingdom will be a place where the nations of the earth and even the powers and principalities that are behind them 
will be able to find refuge. Now, what does that mean? Well, in, in, the, in the, the ancient world, in these suzerainty covenants, they were designed in such a way that this conquering king controlled the foreign policy of his vassal states. But yet they had a tremendous amount of self-rule. The king of kings, the conquering king, didn't care what their religion was. It didn't care, you know, how they ran their economy necessarily. As long as they paid tribute and were loyal and did not cause international disturbance or did not align with other vassal states against the king of kings. Uh, these, these, these were actually set up as very formal documents in the ancient world. They have uh, archaeologists and biblical scholars have discovered various different um, forms of these treaties. They had a prologue, they introduced the king, they talked about the historical relationship and how this state became came to be. There were stipulations, this is how you have to behave, these are the things you have to follow. There are sanctions, this is what will happen to you if you don't follow. And often there were these succession arrangements, how will future generations uh, sustain this covenant. Each party was given a copy of the, of the covenant. There was often a covenantal meal, a uh, sacrifice that, that sealed the covenant. And many scholars see this form in, in many biblical books, especially the Deut book of Deuteronomy, where God set out and laid out a, a suzerainty covenant with, with the nation of Israel that actually has that form. We're not going to dive into all that. But these were very important uh, things. And, and in, in, in the date of Ezekiel, this was a covenant that was to be honored. You know, as Nebuchadnezzar took over Israel, they were required to obey what God had told them to uh, let go of Jerusalem, go under the, 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 the dominion of Babylon for the season that I've ordained it. And uh, Zedekiah, the last king of Israel, and Ezekiel 17, take time to read it, 11 through 20, he was judged severely because he did not honor that suzerainty treaty that he was supposed to have with Nebuchadnezzar. So anyway, this is a common form, and Jesus likens his rule over the nations in Matthew 13 to one of these kinds of treaties. Now, what, is that, um, what does that mean? The first thing it doesn't mean, it is not an endorsement of the moral standards or the laws of any given nation in the world today or any given nation in the world in the last 2,000 years. God isn't saying, you know, the way democracy is better or socialism is better, and I, I believe in democracy, but that all that aside, God isn't judging on the, necessarily on the basis of governments. He's not, all the various political ideologies that we have. He's not governing on a basis of left, right, Democrat, Republican, conservative or liberal. These are all ideologies. As a matter of fact, as given when they're allowed to continue to grow and blossom, they become literally idolatrous. That's why it's so dangerous for Christians to begin to align themselves as this or that, as a, as a fundamental loyalty. Because they become self-serving. They become a kind of systemic form of salvation, how to save the system, how to save the country. So these, Jesus' covenant with the nations is not based upon their moral standards or laws. He's not necessarily judging them as righteous or unrighteous, or he's not reconciled to them on the basis of their laws. I, you might say that sounds pretty strange, but see, there's a lot of biblical precedent for that. Turn for a minute to Jeremiah chapter 25, if you have your Bible. In Jeremiah 25, 9, we read something very strange. This is, again, a one of those 
pre-exile or in the midst of exile text as Nebuchadnezzar is beginning to actually destroy Jerusalem. I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. Wait a minute. And I will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all the nations round about and utterly destroy them and make them a horror and hissing and everlasting devil, uh, desolation. So God's going to use here in this situation of the old in the Old Testament at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem he calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant now is that an endorsement of Nebuchadnezzar's laws this is an endorsement of Nebuchadnezzar's character you know anything but actually I mean Nebuchadnezzar had to go through some serious changes over the course of his life to get aligned with God now let's go a little farther into uh, into the story and into the book of Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah for a moment. And chapter 44. Isaiah 44. In verse 28, the Lord, let's go to verse uh, 26 to just get some context. This is a prophecy concerning Cyrus, king of Persia. Cyrus is going to be the next king in line after Nebuchadnezzar. And he's going to defeat Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And he's going to take over a suzerainty covenant, a suzerainty dominion over the civilized world. And in the process of that, he's going to set the Jews free to go back and build the temple in the city. And he says that in verse 26, that the Lord, confirming the word to his, of his servant and performing the purpose of his messengers, it is I who says of Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built, and I will raise up her ruins again. It is I who says to the depth of the sea be dried up, and I will make your rivers dry. It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and I will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. Here we have Cyrus, king of Persia, not necessarily a uh, Christian man, has all sorts of uh, Persian ideas, Pers Persian religious notions, idolatrous ways, and God calls him my shepherd. Why? Because God's going to raise him up to deliver the Jews. He raised him up to offer safe haven and privilege to the people of God. Very important. We're going to look at that more closely in a few minutes. Then you go a little bit farther again of Cyrus, <clears throat> and he takes it one step farther. The next verse, thus says the Lord to Cyrus, his anointed, whom I have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and loose the loins of kings to open the doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. <clears throat> Cyrus, my anointed, the Hebrew word there is Mashiach. The word Messiah comes from the word Shmir, to Shmir. To anoint. In, in, in Greek, it is our word Christ. So here he takes a pagan king, a Persian king, full of idolatry, and is just put in his heart to do good for the people of God. And on that basis, he's able to call him a shepherd and a Messiah. Let's look at one more. Isaiah chapter 
Isaiah chapter 19, we begin at verse 19. In that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, a pillar to the Lord near its border. It will become a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a champion, and he will deliver them. Very interesting here. Many scholars understand this to be Alexander the Great. And again, there was a migration of about a million Jews to Alexandria, Egypt. And there they established uh, a temple and a place of learning. And it was there that ultimately that arrangement led to the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into, into Greek because there, many Jews were Greek-speaking Jews at the time and many Egyptians were turning to the Lord. But he says that he, this, this, this time, this one who looked favorable, who was favorable to the Jews, was Alexander the Great. Again, probably not the most righteous person on the planet. Matter of fact, there's interesting language here. He says that he said in verse 20, he will set, save, he will send them a savior and a champion, and he will deliver him. The, the Hebrew literally says he will send them a savior, even a great one. The great one has an allusion to Alexander the Great. And even in Acts 5, the apostles kind of allude to this verse as pointing ahead to Jesus when they said that God has appointed a savior, a prince and a savior. And he's speaking to the Sanhedrin about Jesus. So Alexander, Nebuchadnezzar, and, and uh, Cyrus all have something in common. They're all types of Christ. They're all types of someone who is giving favor to the people of God, and therefore they are given favor. So we said at the beginning that Christ is ruling the nations and he's at peace with the nations and he has this relationship over the nations. So then what brings God to peace with these nations? What are the stipulations? What are the conditions? that determine how God will treat a nation, whether it will be blessed or whether it will be judged. Now, there are many things that God can judge and correct a nation's for, nation. I hope, it is my hope, that this country will be rebooted a little bit with some of the things that are going on today in it. And I'm not going to say any more than that. But I want you to turn to Psalm 2. And I think Psalm 2 holds the key to helping us understand what Jesus meant in Matthew 13. And again, I make no claims that this is the end-all, be-all of the subject. But I think it's important for us to understand. God rules the nations now. In Revelation 11 and 17, we are told, Thou hast taken your power and begun to reign. How many times? Is that something off, way off in the future? How many times, or, or, you know, they, they talk about Revelation 20, the reign of Christ being established. How many times does God have to begin to reign? And I'm going to try to close with that in a few minutes. How many times does he have to begin to reign? Once. Psalm chapter 2, and this is actually was quoted in Acts 4 by the praying first century church in the face of persecution. He said, why do the nations, why are the nations in an uproar? 
and the people's devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. So we have this tension now in the world. We have this tension in, in the kingdoms that have not yet come under subjection to Christ. They don't like the restraints. They don't like the moral restraints of the church. They don't like the moral restraints of, of the implications of, of honoring Christ in their national borders. We don't want those restraints on our behavior, on our life, on our politics, on our worldview. He who sits in the heavens laughs. Nobody's wringing their hands in heaven, church. Our God is in absolute control. He laughs. He scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify him in his fury. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. This is an enthronement psalm. This is telling us that God has installed, at the, at the time that God has installed his king, upon his mountain, about his kingdom, about his place of authority, about his throne room, the place of his throne and enthronement, Zion, his holy mountain. This is where he is now establishing his suzerainty covenant with the nations. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. This is the decree. This is the stipulation for the nations. He said to me, this is Jesus, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them like earthware. So this is God in Christ conquering the nations. This is Jesus and the Father talking and the, and the son is saying, and the father is saying to him, now that you have accomplished your mission and have now come and taken up your place, seated at the right hand of the father, seated in the Mount of Zion, in the mountain that cannot be touched, the writer Hebrew said, ask of me and I'll give you the nations. Ask, just ask me, I will give you the nations. And he says this, therefore, O kings, Show discernment, take warning over the judge, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling, do homage or literally kiss the son. That was a sign of deference, a sign of submission, a sign of loyalty, kiss a king. They would, these, these conquered vassal kings would come forward into the throne room of the, of the great king, whether it be Nebuchadnezzar or whoever it may be, they would bow and kiss his feet. They would bow and kiss his ring. Do homage to the Son, kiss the Son, so that he not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge, ref, I'm sorry, refuge in him. What God is saying that Christ is a refuge to those nations who do homage to him. Now, here's the question. How does a nation do homage to Christ. Can a nation, an ideology, be saved in the sense that we understand it? No. A constitution isn't going to heaven. Bylaws aren't going to heaven. The Communist Manifesto can't go to heaven. 330 million people in the United States don't suddenly say, yes, we believe in Jesus and they're all raptured. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is how a nation can align itself with God. How can a nation align itself with the Savior? Well, we're not going to turn to these, but you know what they say. When, when Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and the Lord struck him down on his, off of his horse as he was on his way to continue persecuting Christians, the Lord said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Whosoever touches you, touches me. As a matter of fact, I should read that. I, I think I'm butchering it. Let's read it. we got a few more minutes. Let's read it in John chapter 13. And uh, let's see, I've got verse 20. John chapter 13, verse 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives, whoever I send, receives me, and he who receives him who sent me, and he receives him who sent me. Those ambassadors for Christ, those of us, the church, when a, when a nation gives place to the church, it can be blessed by God. That's the criteria. That's the stipulation. Another verse that is very popular that we understand. Remember Matthew 25. When did we see you naked and in prison? When did we see you, you know, uh, homeless and hungry? Inasmuch you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. When the Lord predicted the judgment against Jerusalem in Matthew 23, we know that the Lord forgave them at the cross, but he said, and I will send you prophets and wise men and some you will persecute and chase from city to city that the guilt of the previous generations will fall upon you. So from our Christian biblical perspective, we are told that kingdoms can rise and fall based on one key thing not their quote-unquote moral standards, but whether or not they receive the church, whether or not they give place to the church. And it is my prayer that this country will not lose its grip on that because I think that is our, that is our root. That is our, our, it isn't a perfect Christian nation, but to give place to the church and allow the church to grow and function So this is now, this reign of Christ is now, this conquering of the nations is now. This revelation, uh, book of Revelation, uh, where, where, where Jesus is conquering in the nations is now. When, when, when we said to, in Revelation 17, you have taken your power and begun to reign and we see earthquakes and trumpets and thunder and earthquakes, that's all reminiscent of Exodus 19. When God appeared on the mountain, the, the language, the imagery is the same. There was a thunder, there was an earthquake, there were lightnings, there were uh, trumpets. It's not revelation as the end of the world. It's revelation as the inauguration of a new covenant, of new covenantal arrangements on the planet, just as it was the inauguration of the old covenant under Moses. Now let's look, let's close with this. This is a powerful verse, a couple of verses. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. This is part of the Emmanuel book, chapter 7 through 12 of, of uh, Isaiah's prophecy. It tells us about a lot of things about Emmanuel, of course, we know that his name shall be called Emmanuel. That's God with us. That was the Jesus's title. Isaiah 9, 6, for a child will be born unto us, a, a son will be given unto us. I think we all understand that that's Jesus. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Interesting statement. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forevermore. 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of armies, will accomplish this. Isaiah says the, 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 the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now, I don't know if Isaiah is exaggerating a little bit. No end until someday God turns the key and shuts it all down. Whatever the case, Isaiah sees this ever-increasing, ever-expanding influence of this mustard seed kingdom that will creep and creep and creep and grow and grow and grow on this planet. Not so that all the world is saved, but that in every nation, they will give deference to the church and God's covenant, God's land, God's place of, God's domain of his kingdom will find place in every kingdom on the earth. And Isaiah doesn't see this as something that's any time. I don't, I don't, I don't see some antichrist coming in the next 10 years or 15 years or 20 years or five years. There's no room for him. Can't go into it all now, but my gosh, church, that's all history and it, it has ongoing implications. I know as Pastor Roz has that kind of viewpoint and so much that we agree on is a few things that we disagree, but we have to stop looking at the world that way and understand that we serve a conquering king. We are ambassadors for Christ in a dying world and that we are called to the nations. You know, Paul, we're getting close to the end here, but Paul, during his imprisonment, he said, I appeal to Caesar. Why did he want to talk to Caesar? Because he wanted to go to the kings. He wanted them to understand that this work of Christ was not just some Jewish theological notion. That Christ had come and he wanted to testify. John was called in chapter 10 of Revelation. You will testify concerning kings. We sing that song. Kings bow down, nations bow down at the sound of your voice. It's staggering to think about our ambassadorship and the very real conciliatory kingdom that we live in and that we're a part of. And I really believe one day when we cross over to the other side and we're, we're given an opportunity to look and we're going to say, my Lord and my God, it was there all the time and I didn't see it. I didn't see what you were doing in the earth. Pretty powerful. So I'm going to close now because I think I've said enough and the time is getting short here. I want to give you a breather before Pastor Oz comes on and Pastor Jan. But I hope that some of this helped to make sense of who we are and what's going on in the world right now and the reign of Christ in the world and, and how that reign is being manifested and growing and, and creeping into all the world. Let's get our head out of looking at Jerusalem or some property in the land or some mausoleum or some, some weird, strange end time scenarios that are concocted by Western culture thinkers and understand that we are part of an ever expanding, ever increasing governmental reign, suzerainty covenant under the King of Kings the last king the world will really ever know, the truest king that the world will ever know, the most powerful king the world will ever know. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I just pray that somehow in my musings that uh, lights will go on and seeds of truth will be planted. I know, Lord, there's more, much more to this than I certainly understand. And I just pray, God, that you will grant us a deeper understanding of these things going forward. I thank you for the opportunity and privilege of sharing today. And I ask you just, Lord, to just continue to bless this day for your people with new awakenings. I pray your blessing to be on uh, Pastor Jan, Pastor Oz, whoever speaks in the next session. And uh, may their word, your word go forth and may your son be glorified in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for checking in.